This year will be Lerefuat, Israel, Ben Ezra, and Natslacha, uh, and Shmirat Ha'enayim, Tikkun Abrit, and uh, of Amir Ben Shahin, and Shiduch uh, for him also as well, Shiduch Tov. Shahin Bat Zari, Natslacha, Rabba, Elt. A blessing, Chaim Tovim, and Zarin Bat Zivande, Refua Shlema, long, healthy, and a good life as well. Also, Refua Albert Ben Rachel, Refua Shlema of Ita Maria Loz Ben Miriam, and Lehavdi, Leilui Nishmat Nathan Ben Norvivish. Tonight is his yard site. Baruch Hashem. Top. We're done with the names. On Shabbat, it was the yard side of Rav Ovadia Yosef. If somebody asks you in this generation which rabbi made a huge impact on the world, is probably on the top of the list. There are a few Baruch Hashem Rabbanim that made a huge impact on the world. Not every big chacham made a huge impact on the world. Some made more than others. Some chachamim, they were only in their environment, the world of yeshivas, meaning they were with their student in their own yeshiva. Maybe in their entire life they saw a few thousand talmidim and that was just about it. But some wrote many books and made a lot of, a lot of lectures and travel everywhere, and build communities, and open up organizations, and open up shuls, and yeshivot, and made a revolution in the world. And definitely in a Sephardi world, nobody made an impact on a Sephardi world in the last hundred years like Rav Ovadia Yosef. He was a messenger from Hashem to wake up the Middle Eastern Jews that came from all the Arab countries and make a lot of them go back to the heritage of their grandparents back in Baghdad or Morocco, Egypt, Syria, Halab, all these places, Lebanon. Jews that in the past generation there was a lot of Chachamim there, a lot of Kabbalists, a lot of big tzaddikim. But in this generation, there was a drop in a level, but he brought everything up. His mamash rebuilt the Sephardi communities all over the world. I don't think there's one Sephardi community in the world that is not influenced by his impact. Besides the dozens of books that he wrote, that Baruch Hashem is the main posek for the nation, it's brilliance in Torah. I decided to dedicate the first few minutes of the lecture to tell you some of the things about him, about his life. Of course, the benefits of it is that we should learn and dream. Maybe we or our children one day will go to that direction. The Rebbe said a story that his books made something. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, Rav Ovadi Yosef lived an entire life, 93 years of life, which you can say surely that from these 93 years, 90 years he was connected to Torah literally non-stop, around the clock. He slept very little. His average sleep at night was between two to four hours maximum, his entire time. It was mamash, if I can use the word addicted, addicted to learning and writing and speaking Torah, his whole life was Torah, which you're going to see from some of these interesting story I collected for you. Rav Ovadia Yosef used to say in his lectures that a Talmid Chacham, a rabbi, that knows a lot of Torah, that closes himself in an isolated place and does not share his wisdom and knowledge to the public, is a, rabbi, is a fair rabbi, fair. What does it mean fair? You know, like fair quote. What's this expression that he made up? He said it's similar to a person that sits in a cold room, everyone around sitting and freezing, and he has a beautiful warm 
fair and he's warm and enjoy. Everybody is freezing and he only care about his own warm coat and feeling great when everyone else around is suffering. So something like this is not good, obviously. If you already got the wisdom and you keep it only for yourself or to a bunch of 10, 20 Talmidim, when you can uh, basically explore to the whole world and publish all your wisdom to the whole world and you're not doing it, it's very bad. Uh, yes, so it's, uh, it's obviously he did it. His son, which is the chief rabbi of Israel today, he said that every place he went, they told him your father was here. Every synagogue, no matter where he was, all over America, Miami, Florida, New York, in the Syrian communities, every synagogue, big ones in Israel that is invited, they show him picture when his father was there 30, 40 years ago, 50 years ago. So it's very interesting. When Rav Ovadia Yosef was 10 years old, his father went to Baghdad for a while in Iraq. Uh, he went to Baghdad and he took him with him. When he arrived to Baghdad, where would he go? Someone who loves to learn from a very young age, he would go to the synagogue over there, where is also yeshiva. He went over there and there were people in their 40s and 50s and 60s learning Gemara there. And he was sitting on the side, 10 years old. And he told them, I'm sorry, but you did not explain the Tosfot in the Gemara correctly. If you will allow me, I will explain it to you. <laughs> they looked at him 10 years old. Imagine 10 years old, how small he was. They said, where do you have this chutzpah? Who are you? <laughs> where do you have the chutzpah to open your mouth around all these chachamim here? After he explained to them the Tosfot, they were shocked. And slowly, slowly, he became their teacher over there. Started to teach them more and more every day. So imagine a scenario, you have a bunch of 50, 60, 7 years old, and a 10 years old kid that just came from Eretz Israel is teaching them Torah, Gemara. Of course, something like this right away made a lot of noise, and the chief Chacham of Baghdad of the community there, he was the Avbedin, his name was Rav Salman Khugi Abudi. And he right away came to see who this kid is. So he came, he started to talk to him. He said, what did you learn? He said, a little Mishnayot I learned. He was very humble. He said, which Mishnayot? He told him, Masechet Brachot. What else? Also, Masechet Shabbat. What else? Also, Baba Metziah. What else? Also, Baba Kama, what else? Also, also, also. He said, why don't you cut the nonsense and tell me everything you learned? Because the list just was, it was already 10 years old only. Kids today, 10 years old, besides playing Game Boys and Xbox and the rest of their nonsense, what else do they know? Huh? I was already teaching them in such a young age. And right away, this rabbi started to learn with him. He was the chief Chacham of Baghdad, learning with a 10 years old Chacham that came from Eretz Israel. His father was Iraqi, Rabbi Yaakov Yosef, that was his father. He came to Eretz Israel, he opened himself a grocery store. And he sent his son to learn in Porat Yosef. And then one day, his rabbi, Rav Ezra Atiyah, which is the rabbi of all the big Sephardi rabbis who came out to the world in the last generation, he saw that the little boy of Adia is not showing up to yeshiva. One day, two days, a week, what's going on over here? He went to his father's grocery store, and he sees he's cutting cheese. So why are you not in yeshiva? He said, my father does not have help. He asked me if I can stay and help him in a grocery store. What else can I do? He came to his father. He said, please send Ovadia back to the yeshiva. I will come every day to work for you in a grocery. He said, no, Chacham, you know, back in time, people knew how to respect Chachamim. Chacham, you're going to work for me? What? I better die than something like this happen. He said, you don't care that your son that is one day going to be the biggest rabbi is cutting cheese over here? 
Obviously, through this conversation, he sent him back to yeshiva. I can think of where would it be if the rabbi wouldn't go to the grocery store, only Hashem knows. Anyway, so later he came back to Eretz Israel, was learning in Porat Yosef, and now came the time of the Shiduchim. I was 20, 21. He went out with a woman. I was already very close to get engaged. The engagement broke off, meaning the, the lechaim that they almost had was broken. And in the end, he did not marry her. Soon I'm going to tell you why. And another story that I will tell you. And uh, now they set him up with Margalit, but Rabbi Avraham Fatal. She was a daughter of a Talmud Chacham. It was big, Mekubal, Rabbi Fatal. They go out on a date. When a guy takes a girl today on a date, what do they do? They go, they sit in the lobby, in a cafeteria, a restaurant, drink something, talk about, you know, get to know each other. He, go, he takes her on a date to a place. They sit over there. Whatever she say, he goes like this. And then she say, what do you think about what I just said? Huh? <laughs> the entire hour she was speaking, and his head is in yeshiva, in a gemara. He wasn't even listening. He just went to make her happy. Yeah, yeah. She said, you're not even listening to me. How do you want to be my husband? No shiduch. Then they told her, listen, you know, give it another chance. You can't break it up after one date. Next date, they decided that he's going to pick her up. And there's no cars, of course. Everybody was very poor in those days. We're talking uh, about 75 years ago. In Eretz Israel, before Israel was a state even. So he decided to walk with her on the street. Beautiful date, taking a girl and have a walk with her. As they walk, he said to her, you see this synagogue? If you don't mind, I have a shiur here from eight to nine. So you have either you can sit, wait for me in this lady section, or you can go around, meet me here nine o'clock downstairs. This is the day, second date. He came down, walked with her another 10 minutes, and he said to her, you see this shul? I'm very sorry, I have another shiur over here from 9.30 to 10.30. Wait for me here, after that we continue our conversation. So she said to him, I don't understand, well, you, 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 came, you came to be on a date with me, or you brought me to shiur Torah? <laughs> he said to her, where else will I have time to date you if not between walking from one synagogue to the other? <laughs> Look how different the world was. Chacham will do such thing today. What? Find me a girl that will agree to marry him. Somehow, after all of that, one thing made her actually happy. When she saw that he's 20, 21 years old coming out of the synagogue and people seven years old kiss his hand, and ask him for bracha, she said, Ma, where do you find something like this? 20 years old, giving bracha to people that can be his grandparents, and how everyone walks with him out, everyone takes him out. Eventually they got married, Baruch Hashem, and they had one kid after the other. All their boys, one by one, became big rabbis. Baruch Hashem. Famous, one famous chief rabbi of Israel. Few of them are Rashi Yeshivot. Baruch Hashem. One of them passed away before Avovadia. Lo Aleinu, he had cancer. His oldest son, Rabbi Yaakov Yosef, suffered before he passed. But he was also a very big chacham. But eventually, after now, they, he got married. They were very, very poor. They rented a room, tiny room. The bed in a room was already the entire room. They had one table and two chairs, two plates, two glasses, one fork, two forks, and two knives. That's it. That's all they had. One time, his rabbi, Rav Ezra Atiyah, came to visit him in his house after he got married. He couldn't walk through the door. There's no room. Bed, table, that's it. He saw how poor they are, they didn't even have a chair to, to offer him to sit, or a plate, or a glass. 
He said to him, why don't you go to Cairo? They're looking for chief rabbi over there, Sfaradi, the Egyptian community. Now remember, this was very, very bad days between Israel and the Arabs, Egypt. It was before the war. There was a lot of tension. Why don't you go to Cairo? The community will pay you an, a respectable salary. And you're going to be the rabbi over there. Because he felt bad that he doesn't have parnasa. At least over there, he's going to make some money. If the rabbi say, nobody argue. He decided they're moving to Egypt. He went to Egypt, became the chief rabbi of Egypt. In Egypt, you have a place, like a museum. It's called Agniza Akairit. What does it mean? They have all the old ancient Jewish books from big rabbis from hundreds of years ago, all kept in one place secretly, you know, with security, tight security. No one is allowed to get anything out of there, but you're allowed to come and read in the books. Since that Hashem gave him a photographic memory that everything he reads, he remembers, he used to go there every day, read the books, go home and write them down from his memory. That's how we have some of the books that he took from Cairo from his memory by reading them over there, coming home and writing them down. So this is who we're talking here about. And let me tell you a few more stories. You know, his brother, Naim, Naim, he had a brother, Naim, Iraqi guy, Iraqi guy, his brother, Naim Ovadia. He said that when they were kids, they were very poor. So when they gave them a plate, it was very little food. It's not that much to eat. So he was always with his books. He never cared about anything, just the books. And his brother says to finish my meal and stay hungry. And he didn't care about food anyway. I used to switch my plate with him. And then after half an hour, he would look at the plate. He said, oh, Baruch Hashem, I ate. I see I ate. That's how he was. He wasn't in this world, Bechadar. By the way, the Chazonish also said, I never knew in my life what hunger is. He never ate anyway. He didn't know what it means because his mind was always in the Torah. They needed, they put someone, they assigned someone to remind him that he did not eat yet. There were many rabbis like this. The stipler was like this. They used to give him a big cookie every day. One time, if Shamash was hungry, he ate the cookies. Anyway, he doesn't remember if he ate or not. So, so the stipler said, uh, he said to him, uh, where, is, where is my cookie? He said, you ate it. He said, no, it cannot be. Why? He said, if I ate it or not, I don't remember. But one thing I do remember, if I made a bracha or not, this I don't forget. Because <laughs> I have all my mind about it. One time it says that the piece from the shitrak fell on a, on a thing. Instead of the cook, he ate that. <laughs> There's all kinds of things that their mind was so deep into Torah that they, they were not thinking where they're going, what they're doing. He did not know. Rav Ovadia used to speak every Thursday in Or Chaim Yeshiva, the shul of Rav Elbaz, the big yeshiva, every Thursday for years, and not once he knew the way where, the, where he's speaking. They always had to show him. Rav, you've been speaking here for years. You still did not learn to go from the car into the place? How, how long does it take? Not even a minute. But his mind was not here. His mind was totally in a different world. You know, one time, there was a, a woman, she came to his house a few years before he passed. She knocked on the door. His shamash opened the door. His name was Rav Hakak, still alive, of course, young. He said, can I help you? She said, where is Ovadia? <laughs> You know, if somebody comes to the biggest rabbi and asks, where is Ovadia, then you know something is not right here. Who are you looking for? Ovadia. You mean Rav Ovadia. Whatever. Is he home? What, what do you need? I need money. I'm a poor woman. I heard he became very rich. Tell him 
Najia is here. He comes inside, so Rabbi, there's a, there's a strange Iraqi woman, old woman here. She calls you, she calls you Ovadia. What did she want? She came for Tzedakah, let her in. Surprisingly, let her in. She comes in, Ovadia, Kifchalak. How are you? How are you, Najia? How was life to you? Don't ask, terrible. I'm very poor and I see Baruch Hashem, you became wealthy. Help me out. Who is this woman? Remember the first date that broke? Why the, why the date broke? They were already ready, getting ready to get married. Because he told her, she told him, listen, will you take me once a month to the theater? It used to be Arabic, Arabic films in those days from Egypt. He said, I'm a Talmud Yeshiva, I'm going to go to a theater. Theater is it's for clowns, not for Talmud Chachamim. She said to him, but I'm a woman, what am I going to do all day at home? What am I, all day I'm going to listen to the radio? Once a month, take me out. He said, I cannot go into a theater. So, so you sleep. Sleep in the theater. Let me at least enjoy a movie once a month. He said to her, Chacham cannot enter such a place. Chilul Hashem. So what do I need you for? Are you going to learn all day in yeshiva and I'm going to be alone without husband? I don't want it. She broke up the shiduch. Imagine the test when you love a woman and you're getting ready to get married and in your mind, finally I found what I'm, I was looking for. Then she breaks your heart like this. It's a conflict between halacha and what you want. Now she's showing up after who knows, eight years later, 75 years, whatever it was. After he gives her the money, she turned around and she said, you don't know how much Hashem loves you. What? I never had kids because I was barren all my life. If you would marry me, you would never have kids. So imagine now how Hashem arranged it that she would be poor and she would think who would give me money. Oh, my first date, he became rich. Let me go to him. And she showed up and the whole thing was just that she should tell him that imagine if you would go with her to the theater and compromise what would be your end. One time a poor man came banging on the door like maniac. Boom, boom. Uh, the shamash opens the door, what's going on? He said, I'm, I'm poor. I'm tired of collecting shekel by shekel. Tell the rabbi I need help. <laughs> he said, the rabbi is in the middle of learning now. He cannot disturb him now. He said to him, I'm not leaving here until the rabbi see me. I'll bang until tomorrow, I don't care. He comes to the rabbi, what's going on, he said. Somebody poor, let him in. The guy goes in, Rabbi, I need money. He said, wait here. He went inside, he gave him 2,000 shekel, it's now money. The, the poor man was kissing his hand, thank you, Chacham, thank you. Just when he's about to leave, Rabbi Vadia said, wait one minute. It was before Yom Tov, a few days before Yom Tov. He said, wait, wait. He went and took another 1,000 shekel, and he came to him and he said, this is to buy a gift for your wife. That's not, that's not, I gave you already. But this is specially for your wife. This is how his mind was thinking. Yom Tov, you got to buy her something nice. It's amazing how one time when he was already, he moved to, uh, to our north, where he lived for the rest of his life. Before he moved there, he lived in a building. And in, in Israel, you have uh, one of the tenants is in charge of the board. He's making the decision to clean the building, fix the electric, you know. And they collect money from every tenant. Just like maintenance. Every tenant has to pay. And once a year, they have a meeting. All the tenants of the building, what is the plan for the next year. We have to fix this, we need that, that's gonna cost this, who can help, tough. 
So they want uh, Rav Ovadia to come to the meeting. He's going to waste them an hour now with the secular people, all kinds of neighbors. What, he's going to sit an hour with them? So he sent his shamash. You go see what they want. They say to the shamash, we're sorry, you're not one of the tenants here. The rabbi lived in this building, he has to come. He said, the rabbi is a very busy man, he doesn't have time to sit in a board talking about painting the building. That's why he sent me. No, no, it doesn't work that way. Then everybody else would send someone else. We actually need a tenant. She doesn't let go. The rabbi cannot come. I'm sorry, I cannot start the meeting until he comes. <laughs> he comes to him, he says, Rabbi, that's the case. Tov, close this book, close the Gemara. He went, he sat over there. After he left, the woman was trying to get up from the chair. She became paralyzed in her leg. She cannot get up, can't move the legs. She started to scream, what's going on? I can't move my legs. It's a famous story. Quickly, she realized what happened. Call, call the shamash again. She called, tell Rav Ovadi, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean, I didn't understand, he's so upset about coming here. Tell him to forgive me. So he said to him, tell her, if she accepts on herself never to waste time of rabbis and Talmidei Chachamim, I will give her a blessing, she will be okay. And that's how she came out of it. There was much something that happened. You know, they made a documentary about his life. There was one secular Iraqi Israeli professor from the university. Not religious. One time the professor came to him to ask him a complicated question. Now he had 40,000 books in his house. 40,000. The whole house was books, basically. There's no walls. He said to him, go to the third room. On the right side, on the second shelf, third floor, you're going to see a book. That's the name of it. Go bring it. This professor went, found the book. As he told him, exactly remember each one of the 40,000 books where they're located. One by one. The professor brought the book, he said, open in page 76. He opened, he said, read over there. The professor, the secular professor, he said, I swear on my life, I never saw in my life such thing. Before I even started to read, he told me the whole page by heart. <laughs> I, I was speechless. <laughs> he said, he, this is his words. Aish yada et kol adaf the man knew the entire page by heart. Why? A blessing. Photographic memory. Everything he learned. The point that his memory was so amazing that people made a joke in Israel. That one person came to him and said, Rabbi, they say you know the whole Torah by heart. He said, ah, don't exaggerate. Not the whole Torah, only half. So oh, half, it's also a lot. Which half? He said, whichever one you want. Whichever you choose, <laughs> you know. So anyway, uh, his son, uh, one of his son is Rosh Hashivat Yechevedat. He said that after he passed, they opened his books to look at his comments. And they found in the books dozens of checks and bills and lirot from the time of 40, 50, 60 years ago, money that no one uses anymore. They even found checks from 40 years ago that he never deposited. He forgot them in the Gmarot. He was pulling them. He was so deep into this. You know how much money they found, but all of it is all money. <laughs> There's nothing they can do with that. That's how much he was deep in the Torah that he wasn't, he wasn't even focusing on other things. You know, there's a famous story that one, one couple that could not have kids for 20 years, they came to him. They were crying, we tried everything, doctors, treatment, that's it. We are fed up to here. This is our last chance. Please pray for us, give us a blessing that we have kids. As they cry, he also had tears. He wrote something on the note, he folded the note, and he gives it to them and says, and the breath of your son opened the note. Not before. Okay, Rabbi. 
Nine months later, after that visit, the woman gave birth. Triplet. Triplet. Three boys. They opened the note, and it was written, V'yikare shmam b'Yisrael, Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. He gave them a note. In the time of the Brit, opened the note. In the, in the note, it said, call them Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. Ramash Ruach HaKodesh. There's thousands of stories like this, about him, about Chacham Ben Zion, Abba Shaul, about other big Chachamim. But since it was his your site. The story about the computer, where he found the mistake, but the professor called him by the, the wife, but all the, all the books When they brought the first IBM computer to Israel, they needed a brain that can compete with the computers. They called him. He was the first one who actually was able to, I don't know exactly what was the test over there. But one of the most amazing stories, one of the most amazing stories that uh, is that uh, in his life, when he was in Egypt, there was one uh, shochet, slaughter animals, it wasn't Yereshamai, it wasn't Tzaddik, he was doing all kinds of non-kosher things. People warn him, the rabbi, this guy is not reliable, cannot buy meat from him. He warned him, it didn't help. He took away his certificate. He cannot be shochet. What, it's my parnasa. He say your parnasa is important, but it's more important than thousands of people eating not kosher meat because of you. Many years later, like 30 years later, Rav Ovadia already moved back to Israel, and he was the Dayan in Petach Tikva with Rav Eliashiv. Rav Eliashiv was also in a bed din. This man showed up, he already came, went back to Israel, and again slaughtered. And it came to, someone remembered that Rav Ovadia took away his, his, and he told everyone, be careful for me, it was not reliable. He came to Rav Ovadia's room with a gun pointed the gun to his head and say to him, you have two chances now, two choices. One, you sign that I'm reliable and I'm kosher to do shechita, or I kill you and I, I don't care what's going to happen. He said to him, you can kill me as much as you want. I will never sign for people to eat meat from your hand. He got started to scream, this, that. When it comes to the truth, a gun to the head, he did not agree to, you know, compromise with the guy. Even 30 years later, he came with a gun. He took away, obviously, nobody wants to eat his meat. You know, one story happened with me. That's maybe what should be the last story. I used to give lectures here in the Jamaica Avenue in the real estate office every Friday between 12 and 2. It was a bunch of Israeli guys and girls in their 20s. They're all working in real estate. Some, some of them today are very rich people. They own a lot of real estate. They became tycoons. But back then, it was the first year or two that they all started to work as real estate agents. One girl there, she was academic, you know, went to university. Everybody else was not so academic. I used to prove to them the Torah is divine. She was impressed. Wow, science proved that the Torah is divine. One time I said, I would like to invite all of you to my house for Shabbat. Friday night, we sit in the table, maybe about 20 guys and girls. We're sitting over there, and uh, we give the vrai Torah until I made the mistake of my life. I said, Rav Ovadia Yosef say in his speech such and such, she looked at me, Ma? This is your hero? I thought you civilized. I thought you intelligent. I didn't know you affiliated with him. I said, well, what's the problem? Don't you hear the news? You know, in the media, you know how they lie about rabbis nonstop, whatever they can just bring out. So I, I didn't know what to do now. In one hand, I'm afraid to lose her. On the other hand, I cannot be silenced when she put the biggest chacham down. 
thinking what to do, Hashem gave me a brilliant idea. I said to her, tell me, who is the greatest secular Israeli that you admire? She said to me, Professor Aaron Barak, the president of the law faculty and a professor in Harvard. I said to her, if I would come to Professor Barak and ask him a question about two neighbors fighting about the wall or anything like that, will he be able to tell me the history of this question in all the courts all over the world in the last thousand years by heart? She told me, no, you have an archive for that. If the judge wants to look at other cases, he goes to the archive and he see. You're not supposed to know it by heart. I say to her, come, come over here. I have all these books over here. I say, pull one of the book. She pull one. Open anywhere you want. She opened. What question came out? Is a Jew allowed to go to Egypt on a trip? Because in the Torah it says, you will never see them again. What did Hashem mean? The power and his people or all the people of Egypt? Did he mean not to live in Egypt or not even to visit Egypt? There's a lot of dilemmas here. So somebody asked him that question when Israel supposedly made peace agreement with Egypt. He want, yeah, and, this, the, and the show was every Friday live. People called back then, there was no internet, nothing, live. And he answered spontaneously with no preparation. And the host was saying, Rabotai, I want you to know the rabbi does not have any books here. We are alone in a studio and the questions are live. There's no time to prepare. I say to her, all these shows were recorded and this was all printed in this book, Yechevedat. You see, thousands of questions. Do you want to see how many quotes he was bringing from his head, memorizing the pages, how many books, this? You ready? Every time you see parentheses, it's another source. She started to count with me. One, five, 10, 20, 30, 40. We got to 50 already. I said, look, in one question, he already gave 50 sources from 50 different books. But look, there is another 10 pages. We're gonna get to 150 sources on one question and there are thousands like this here. Do you know another person in the world that can do such thing? She looked at me. She said to me, wow, that's unhuman. That's not, it cannot be. I said, oh, now you understand what it means. She said, I'm so ashamed. <laughs> She became Baala Tshuva. Few years later, I go to Costco, Friday morning. I wait until they open 10 o'clock. I see a minivan pull over. Few religious kids, peot, yamakas coming out. Who do I see? This woman. By now she got married, she have kids. I was thinking to myself, Rav Ovadia, you made this entire family religious, you never even met them. <laughs> huh? What got her? That was the final step to become religious. She realized how much she was in a lie. The secular media, how much they brainwash people with lies. And she just thought, this person I thought is primitive and barbaric and this, turned to be the smartest, the holiest, everything the opposite of what they've been telling me. She started to go seriously into the religion. Today they have a successful business with food, everybody's visit there, Thursday and Friday, everyone in Monsi is by them. One thing leads to another. What do you see, Rabotai? The schut of the Chacham, sometimes it's enough not to even be there, just his name is brought up or something that happened with him, it's enough to influence other people. So, you know, the, the, the final thing, and we move on, the final thing is, you should know, just people, out of many millions of wicked people. In the beginning, the, the Khatam Sofer, he has a book, it's called, he lived 200 years ago in Hungary, Khatam Sofer, big Chacham. In his book, Torah Moshe, 
He brings a midrash that says, Venoach matzah hen b'ene Hashem, meaning only Hashem liked him. No one else. Wicked people love righteous person. They're full of anger. When you have all these low lives out there, when they see one Talmud Yeshiva, they want to kill him. What did he do to them? Nothing. It just bothered them. Someone actually made it. And we are all losers here. Or they may don't believe that the Torah is the right way, so automatically they're allergic to someone that is different than them. Who do you think you are? Or they, they think that he looks at them down, meaning he thinks he's here and we are all the way down. So there are many reasons why they hate the Chachamim. Or they ate the tzaddikim. The Midrash say, only Noah was found favor in the eyes of Hashem. No one else did. Noah found favor in the eyes of Hashem, which is the most important thing. What is this Midrash come to teach us? What exactly is this Midrash wants to say? If the Midrash would not say it, we didn't understand it from the verse, that Noah is the only one who found favor in the eyes of Hashem. If other people would, they would be also saved in the ark. Every fool understands this math, right? In the end, he is the only one that Hashem gave an assignment to make an ark and save the animals and, and save himself. If there would be another 50 people, they said, take this guy and this guy and this one and this woman, make sure all of them go into the ark. They're much more important than the animals. That's for sure. What do we need this Midrash for? So the, the answer is, when you say that only one person found favor in the eyes of Hashem, that means there's not even one, there's not even one more. Because if there would be more than one, the Torah would not just focus on one. It's not fair towards the others. So the prophet Irmiya is saying something very interesting. This is what he said. Shotetu bechutzot Yerushalayim. Go check in the streets of Jerusalem. Go check in the streets of Jerusalem. How many years ago Prophet Jeremiah lived? 2,500 years ago. Approximately. So the Prophet say, Shotetu bechutzot Yerushalayim. Go check in the streets of Jerusalem and, and see. If you find anyone that is righteous, searching for the truth, I...